My name is Donald Rogan and I'm representing Nedbank Private Wealth. Just a special thank you to all of you for joining us today. In particular to thank those of you in the audience who are already clients of ours, thank you for your time. And then a special mention to those of you who are not clients of ours, thank you for coming. And I'm sure once we're through this campaign and through this process, you will be part of the Nedbank Private Wealth family and I'll be standing outside that door with my business card. But <laughs> thanks for coming. The reason why we're here all today is to have a, a frank discussion around wealth. What does wealth mean to you? When someone mentions the word, word wealth to you, what do you think of? Is it the ability to buy that red shiny sports car? Is it the ability to go on holiday to exotic destinations? Is it the ability to ride a horse out here behind us and be a member of this exclusive club? Or is it simply the ability to give? To give to your loved ones or to give to those less fortunate than you are? And that's what we're here today to discuss. At Nedbank Private Wealth, we've been advising clients for many decades. And there is no doubt when you break wealth into its simplest form, it is about the numbers. That is the foundation of wealth. And that is what we are experts at doing. But for many of us in this room, I believe wealth means so much more than that. And this is what we are here today to discuss. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Raik van and the and, and the panel. And before we start, Raik, just to thank MoneyWeb for partnering with Nedbank Private Wealth on this journey in discovering the meaning of true wealth. Thank you. Yes. Uh... Thanks, everybody, and really welcome. I think this is an exciting topic. I think uh, it's a topic we don't always talk enough about. Um, and, uh, you know, the story of money is a very interesting one. It has a lot of different perceptions. But let me just first address the uh, elephant in the room. My name is Raik, um, not the garden appliance, uh, but... <laughs> I'm a financial journalist, and the irony is there. I've been, uh, been, I'm being reminded every day. But on, the, on this side of the, uh, the panel today, I'm asking the questions, and I'm really willing to learn. I think there's a lot of inspirational stories to be told. Um, I know some of the stories of the, the panelists, and, and it is really, really good. But uh, yes, what is wealth? You know, uh, you know, people see it totally in totally different perceptions. Is it, uh, is it money? Is it financial independence? Is it financial security? Is it an enabler of happiness? And uh, is it something you treasure because you want to share it? Is it a legacy? There are very, very different perceptions, and hopefully we can ventilate that with this excellent panel today. A quick introduction, uh, Pepe Moray. He's, of course, the uh, founder of uh, Joe Public and uh, a phenomenal entrepreneur uh, created a business that has transformed the agency and advertising and communications industry. And uh, if you've read his book, you know that the wind has not always been at his back. But uh, there are some uh, fantastic inspirational thoughts coming from him. I saw the video you did and uh, I was really, you know, it does uh, change your mind and change the way you think. Um, then uh, Miles Kubeka, uh, one of the most fascinating stories in South Africa saw a TV ad, started a business selling hot dogs, and today it's a virtual empire. Uh, the restaurant in Velakazi Street is uh, phenomenal, um, and, it, and it shows you how passion can lead to success. And uh, I think uh, I really hope to, to, to hear your, your views. And then, of course, well, Mike Wilmot, he is uh, head of advice and solutions at NetBank Private Wealth. Uh, I like the solutions part, I will see you later. Um, <laughs> to solve the problem. And of course, uh, wealth needs to be managed. Uh, you know, there's an accumulation strategies, there are preservation strategies, there are management strategies that are absolutely critical to all wealth um, from, from individuals, from families, from companies, and so. But uh, Pepe, I want to start with you, and I'm going to just throw the question out there. Uh, how do you see wealth? What is your perception of, of, of wealth? I'm still dealing with the fact that your name is Reich. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you know in, in, in English that means rich. What is my perception of wealth? So, 
So, <laughs> as, a, as a financial journalist. But um, it's interesting because where I come from, I always aspired to be rich, so wealthy to be rich. And it always to me meant having X amount of millions, buying a yacht and sailing the world. For a long time of my life, everything was motivated by money. Wealth was very one-dimensional. And it was very much about the self-serving part of it. Um, and interesting that the yacht was part of it because that also plays into my ego and the richness and what money can do for you on that level. But I had quite a um, fundamental life change 13 years ago. And it opened my mind to what true wealth really means. Um, and, and it's not just learning from, it's also in my own experience. It became very much about Spiritual wealth, you know, so, so my spirituality, self development, um, the, 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 the quality life for my family, or just our relationships. So, not even the house we live in, the car we drive, just having that relationship, that, that close relationship, my health became a huge thing for me. And those all formed aspects of, of wealth, almost more importantly than the money. But what's interesting is, I would honestly, I can say that. Wealth is probably my second value in life. I really value wealth because it's, 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 it's the enabler of all those other things. So I'm, I'm very big into CSI. I've got my own nonprofit organization. And, and even there, it's not possible to, 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 uh, to make anything happen without the money. But wealth to me is, is the money is almost a byproduct. It's, it's the enabler. Wealth to me are the other areas, spiritual, family, my health, giving back to society. Um, yeah. But when, of course, we, we, if your aim is money and being rich, mm. uh, some, there must be a, an inflection point somewhere where you realize, listen, I have enough. Let's uh, change the perception of wealth. Uh, do you have such a, an inflection point? So, not quite to that point, but, but there, there was a definite shift because when we went bankrupt, I think it was 2009, um, as a business. And up to that point, even before that, it started going down. I was, not, I was not manifesting money because my approach was I want to make money. The inflection point of where wealth started coming into my life is when I went into service of other people. And, and, and hence, I had a very specific experience with, with money. I don't think that answers your question, but, but th there was a change in my way of being in terms of stepping into true service naturally. Um, which changed my relationship with money, and money started coming into my life. Mm -hmm. And that could sound quite esoteric, um, but that's my truth. Mm. Miles? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Interesting story. <laughs> yeah. You see some, uh, some of the same things in the journey. So, I was, I'm a systems engineer by training. I was working at Microsoft, having fun, traveling, and um, one of the first things you learned in Microsoft is that the world is big and you should dream really, really big. Um, and it was all cool until I saw a TV advert about this character called Vuyo who was selling Borovos rolls on the side of the road and he grew that business into a multi-billion dollar business, um, ironically starting from selling Borovos, from selling from Borovos carts onto having a yacht and, uh, and an aeroplane called Air Force One. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I, and I thought, damn, that's a cool story. I wonder if this is based on a true story, because that's inspirational. I, I wouldn't mind a life trajectory like that. And, uh, and then I Googled, only to discover there was no Voyo. It was a totally fictitious character dreamt up by these guys in an advertising agency in Cape Town. So I, then I promptly trademarked it, and I became Voyo from that day on. Uh, now even my mother calls me Voyo. But um, the interesting part about the journey is, you know, around the wealth part, because all that stuff that Voyo achieved essentially was just rich, right? It's monetary. And I think there's a difference between rich and wealth. Rich is the ability to buy everything. Wealth, I think, is a little bit more transcendent. It's generational. It's legacy. It's all those things. It's freedom. Um, and I can only sum it up this way. My mom has always said to me, don't be an also-ran in life. If 5,000 people set out to run a marathon, 
4,999 of them serve to legitimize the winner. They are there so that there's a number one. So she always said, go and stand for something, be somebody, change the world. And I remember thinking to myself, lay off me, woman, I'm only three years old. <laughs> um, but unintentionally, she instituted in me a sense of purpose, a sense of existence, a sense of self-worth. Um, that quickly, most people get to a point where you are now wealthy and you start wanting to give back to society, largely because you, you can't take the money with you and you, know, it's, you just want the world to see you in a specific way now that you are about to exit. So for me, it happened much earlier. I realized you don't need money to do that. You don't need money to essentially change the world and have an impact right now. You can leverage it, and it helps if you, there, is a, there is some. But, you know, seriously, you don't. And I realized this also when I started a business. You don't really need huge capital. You just need the chutzpah. You just need to start. And that's probably the hardest part. That's just the starting. And, and, and for me, that's been my full circle. Now that I run a food accelerator, I, I help other entrepreneurs literally kick off uh, and get that done. But, you know, being an entrepreneur, you make it sound easy, and, and it's not <laughs> always easy, and, and it's 18-hour days, and the six hours you sleep, you dream about the business, and it's uh, a lot of focus, a lot of stress, a lot of worry, yes. sometimes a lot about money. Yes. When did you realize, listen, this is working, uh, the money is coming in, and... Uh, Honestly, I don't ever think you realize it's working. You're always paranoid. You're always thinking there's something coming down the corner. You know, so, and you don't even know when it's working. It's like you're just in a perpetual state of doing that there's no time to go, oh, look at this kind of thing. You know? And half the time you feel like an imposter because you know, some people celebrate what they perceive as successes, but because you know where you need to be, it's always like, when am I going to get there? And not from a monetary point of view, just from the world-changing aspect of it, or whatever your vision is. So uh, my biggest frustration, like I look at this room, right? Um, the fact that it's a wealth uh, breakfast, the assumption is that most people are relatively successful or relatively wealthy, whatever that measuring stick is. But I really think we should be having these conversations to younger people. I would have loved to be in this room when I was in my 20s because that's where you can shape and propel someone on the right path. I was never taught personal finance at any stage. Three degrees later, there was, I never went to a class that said personal finance 101. It's just it's assumed that I'm going to know how to manage personal, my personal, like from where? I grew up in Soweto. Like, my uncle was the one who was asking me for money, right? So, like, how does that, <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, you know, so if we can start fixing that side of it, I think, you know, will go a long way to also just making sure that the country is financially sound because it starts with individuals. And by the way, that's one of the reasons why most entrepreneurs fail is because they can't manage their personal finances, ergo they can't manage their business finances. They run out of cash. Yeah, the first money through the door goes into a new car. Mm. Uh, nice shiny one. Uh, Mike, you manage people's wealth. Um, of course, you deal with individual clients. Do you see that their perceptions of wealth are different? Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> and I think it is, it comes back to this, which we're all agreeing on, that wealth is much more than money. So Don opened up and said it starts with the money, and that is primarily our job around managing the money. Um, but I'd actually argue that that's not primarily our job. Um, it actually does start with um, getting to the bottom of what, what wealth means to you, what money means to you. And it is the connection of the money that you have or you aspire to have um, with a life well lived. And so it's looking at what that means for you and the options that it can give you, um, the fulfillment, the respect uh, to be valued by, um, your family, your friends, the communities. Uh, and I think those are the actually the, the primary uh, pass around um, the relationship with money and wealth before you get into uh, the actual money management uh, part of the relationship. And I think it's, it is fundamental that, um, that wealth is a lot more um, than just the, the value um, of, of money under consideration. But those perceptions must change. Both the panelists started with uh, very little and it's grown mm -hmm. into a big success story. Uh, 
not only the entrepreneurial side, but also the wealth side of it. Um, how do you address those changing perceptions? Well, we were discussing uh, earlier amongst ourselves that you know, it, it does take money to make money. And so, so your perception of money, it might start with, um, I think it often starts with looking outside and saying, um, look at that guy in, in, the, in the red car. Um, and it's a great irony because people look at the person with the stuff, with the red car, and say, wow, wouldn't it be cool um, if I had that red car? They don't look at the person and say, that person is cool because they have, they have this money. Um, but they want, they want the car. Um, and so I guess it starts with that, that you want, you, you have ambitions, like Pepe said, to, it, it's about money. I want to be rich. And if I am rich, um, not to similar to, um, if I'm healthy, um, if, I'm, if I'm, and when I have that, then I will be happy. And I guess that's the narrative. Uh, and perhaps over time, life shows you that um, there is much more to life than money. Um, and you do need it to enable those other things. And so your perception of it changes around how that money enables what, you, what really matters to you. Mm. And that can be something very different to, to the red car or what society sees as representing happiness. And so I think those things do evolve. And, and you do need to have money to start. We're not talking about the extremes. Um, but I think uh, it gives you that optionality. And one of those optionalities is to reflect around how you use that privilege and the options that money gives you uh, towards different components of a life well lived. Yeah, one of the, the things I've picked up is both of you are giving back, um, trying to help other entrepreneurs in your respective fields to try and kickstart their journey. Uh, when did you decide to, to do that and, and, and what motivated that? Ask me. Yeah. Um, so I suppose. I started realizing that there's no mentorship in, in the SME market. So when you start a business from scratch as an entrepreneur, there's no one you can turn to. Absolutely no one. It's a very lonely journey. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I started with a partner, and I've got a lot more, a whole bunch of us together now. But over the years, I realized what a blessing that is. I mean, even yesterday, Gareth came and just offloaded to me for half an hour in my office. Just that opportunity to have a soundboard or just someone's shoulder to cry on and vice versa often. Um, and I suppose it's, it's that experience and then getting into a position, and I agree with you, it's still 21 years later on the edge. It feels sometimes it's on the edge of sinking or flow, like fly. It's just on the edge all the time. It, it doesn't get easier. It actually gets more difficult. Um, and interestingly, the bank only gives you overdraft once you're successful. So, <laughs> so, so but... But, but I, I saw a personal need, so, so it's also part of my purpose as a, as a person. On the, my, my purpose is to bring out the best in people around me, so to assist people where I can, where my time will allow without losing focus on the business. So I just opened myself up. I'm inundated with, with giving mentorship to small entrepreneurs. Um, and that, it, it, it was a byproduct of a shift in my, own, um, in my own life, where I became more in service of others. But I'm, I'm becoming quite sort of diligent in not giving too much of my time because I also recently learned about responsible giving. You know, I can't become irresponsible to my own business and my own focus and my own clients' needs. But I give as much as I can because there's such a need. And this country needs entrepreneurs more than anything. And, and, and they need to be supported and helped. So, so as entrepreneurs who are starting to succeed and, and, and taste the fruits of our labor, I think it's our duty to give back and to help other entrepreneurs. I think uh, entrepreneurs never really get the acknowledgement they, mm. uh, for the contribution they are making because uh, it's not only personal wealth you create, you create wealth uh, downstream with employees and, uh, and, and inspiring other people. Uh, can you maybe discuss your, the, the way you decided to start your accelerator? Yeah, I, I just happened to be at a, a meeting and, um, you know, I, it just we're having a conversation and um, there were senior people there and and I realized that usually it's always the corporates that have the, the major visibility and yet when things go south it's the corporates that retrench faster than anybody else right so to me there was a, a disconnect that the limelight seems to be going to corporates and yet um, 
as an aspiring entrepreneur, there were no rock stars I could look up to. There was no black, self-made uh, entrepreneur. I can say that guy created something from nothing. It's not linked to minerals or is linked to, um, he literally, it didn't exist. And he started from ground zero and he built something from it. And I think, because essentially that's in, that ends up being a corporate, right? You end up employing a lot of people. And I thought there's a, there's a definite um, miss there. If we don't address that, if uh, a CEO can't see a Temba that is successful, like what does he aspire to? Everybody ends up just wanna being a DJ because those guys, I can see them, I mean, they're doing well and they're having a rock star lifestyle. And, and who wouldn't want that? And, and I'm assuming when we say the red car, we're referring to a Ferrari, right? <laughs> you can just, but who wouldn't want that? But all the stories around entrepreneurship, it's always, because it is hard, it's a calling. It's, 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 it's far from being fun. I'm not gonna lie to you. It's probably, it's irrational in terms of how hard it is, right? So you gotta entice people to realize that, yeah, sure, it's gonna be graft, but there's an upside if you uh, are persistent in it. And, and if you don't see someone who looks like you, who's had a similar lived experience as you, the likelihood of you going in there is almost zero. So then it becomes a responsibility, and I see it as a responsibility more so than giving back, because I think giving back insinuates that you've already taken more than you should have in the first place. But for me, it's, I have to do it. I don't have a, it's not an option. It's something that just has to be done. Yeah. Mm. Mike, you know, listening to this, uh, of course, it's, it's difficult to, to manage uh, a wealth portfolio. Um, how, how would you adapt something, such a strategy to, to this thinking? Um, well, I think it's interesting uh, listening to Miles, and I've got Vuyo up to stack, so I may call you Vuyo. <laughs> 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 um, talking about that personal finance gap, um, as well as in the context of entrepreneurs and small businesses, um, and I think it's very relevant if you look at the, the, the transition of the role of banks. Um, and fairly recently, Ned Bank went out with a fairly gritty campaign around money secrets. Um, of saying, you know, let's look at, let's talk about, um, let's talk about money and the reality of money, not in the glamorous yacht way. In the 82% of small businesses fail because of bad cash flow and finance, personal finance management. That 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 link, um, and that you know, one in three South Africans has been scammed through pyramid schemes. Mm. Um, and so, how can banks play a role in helping, um, not through um, withholding finance when it's needed, but actually the behavioural, the nudging. Um, and, and looking at these problems of, of personal finance. Um, and I think that's an interesting transition around there's philanthropy and there's skills transfer, and then there's the role of corporates around saying, how do we encourage and incentivize better behavior from consumers, from businesses, and help them to be successful? Mm. Um, and so it's a change around, and that's Nedbank's stated purpose of, of financial experts who do good, um, of saying we, we've got a role to play to change these behaviors because it's good for the consumer, it's good for businesses, it's good for the economy, and it's good for us. Um, and that's quite a big change around looking at the ecosystem differently, um, I think from a Ned Bank perspective, and it's not pure philanthropy, mm -hmm. uh, but I think it is um, a, a change in mindset uh, from a bank saying, no, no, you don't, you don't qualify for a loan. I really want to make a comment. Yes, that, please. Because it's so spot on. Because um, we were chatting about it before, and now that you say it, because there might be this assumption, like as not, I'm a, I'm a creative being and I'm, I'm like a glorified factory manager. So I'm super passionate about product. I put product above everything and I believe money is a byproduct of product. And I, I operate on my intuition. But I was saying earlier on, if a bank could give me an advisor mm. on certain key decisions in my life, just a soundboard, if I want to buy a property, um, can I call on something? Just to give me a sound second, more logical, because everything is an emotional decision mm -hmm. <laughs> for me. And interestingly, it's not something that you need to be, oh, that's part of your service. I think you can monetize it as a product. Mm -hmm. I'd be willing to pay 5,000 Rand for one hour of someone's time when to come and make a key decision with me if I buy a piece of property. That's just kind of like in the mindset, not emotionally involved with that purchase to say, 
Um, I'm not sure if this is right because right next door there's a derelict house and that might influence your X, Y, Z. And I'm just in the state of, oh, it's opposite the school. That's a real case scenario and I'm sitting with this dog of investment now. So I think this, this opportunity to step in and, and become true financial advisors for people beyond how do I make this money work more, how do I actually make key decisions on investments can be monetized. And, and I'm just speaking for myself. It, be, it will be a huge service to me. Yeah, that is a big industry in itself. Um, mm, and, but the problem is sometimes you get the wrong advice. And I think to trust in the advice is yeah. absolutely critical. Um, and, uh, but um, a lot of your wealth is locked up in the, your businesses. Mm. Um, it's on paper. It's not cash in your pocket. Uh, how, how do you approach that and the perception of wealth um, and possibly the risk attached to it to have it you know, dominated or it's all in, in, in virtually one place or in one group? Uh, Miles? <laughs> you know, I was, uh, I guess I was relatively privileged in, in a sense that um, I had a I got a bursary and uh, I happened to go to a good school and so forth. So I really got an amazing job working, for example, at Microsoft. And I was there when it was, it was really cool to be at Microsoft. And like, we literally looked that way, we were making money. And I remember I was young, dumb, and uh, <laughs> the ones who are laughing knows what's the, <laughs> the last part of that statement. Um, and I remember I bought a Porsche, young in my 20s, late 20s. The red one. No, it wasn't red, it was actually gray. <laughs> it was a startup pack, but it was one nonetheless, right? <laughs> it, it, so, but it was so embarrassing in that I was so young. I mean, I, was, I, I literally was, I, I would park it in basement three because the only other person who drove with Porsche was the MD, right? <laughs> and. And it was an itch, like you were saying, that, you know, the self-worth thing, that mm -hmm. it wasn't for no other reason but to, to, conf to confirm to myself that I'm worth something more than anything, right? But it was an itch. But I scratched it. The leather was nice and it was cool. Yeah, it did improve the social life. I'm not going to lie. Mm -hmm. But I scratched the itch and I moved on. Never bought another sports car after that. And what I find and I see a lot in my community is then people buy the next bigger one and bigger one and more, 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 more. And they get stuck in that cycle. And because I, I think it is important to scratch an itch. I never had. I've always seen other. I wanted to affirm. But I think it's important once you've affirmed to move on, to self-actualize and do more. And don't let the stuff that you own own you. And, and often people realize that later on in their life, uh, I think, and the privilege I've had is also I've met very many great people who are at the twilight stage of their lives and they're willing to share that, dude, get over that. The, those are not the things you're going to remember when you get to my age. I just personally wish that wisdom could be commoditized and democratized so that see, poor Temba and everybody has the same luxury of that same advice. I think we would go much further as a country. But for a young person, that is a very mature way of thinking about it. When, when did you realize, listen, this Porsche, Porsche uh, phase of my life is over. Let's rather try and focus on, uh, you know, creating opportunities uh, and improving your life in other ways. I think, again, it's going to go back to my mother. I, privilege starts with your social capital and it's usually your family first. I can't say it any differently. I wish I could cookie cutter her and spread it out. And I think, because a lot of entrepreneurs I've spoken to, because obviously from an accelerator, I get to speak to amazing guys doing some really, really cool stuff. And essentially what comes out, out of all of them, if you really dig deep, it's their mothers. Yeah, fathers are there, but we, and essentially guys, as fathers, we need to step up. Eh? Because seriously, you name them, from the most successful guys, you ask them who has had the most influence. Bill Gates will tell you, mom, right? Consistently, right? And I also think it's largely because moms don't have egos. Guys, when we get to a certain age, we want buildings named after us, we want statues. 
you never see statues of women by themselves. You know what I mean? Guys will pay for a statue. Women are like, yeah, I, I've got real statues. They're living. They walk and talk. They'll, they'll sing my praises. And I think if we could do a more of that, we would seriously, seriously have a huge impact. What did your mother say about your Porsche? <laughs> she was more upset when I told her I was leaving Microsoft to sell Borovos rolls. She was like, <laughs> um, that, was a, that was a tougher sell. <laughs> and you also realize that sometimes people don't start businesses because it's not necessarily their own fears. It's the family's fears. It's everybody else's fears than theirs. And that's why it holds people back. No, I'm just, it's, it's fine. It's just making me think of so many things now because there's, there's so many parallels. Um, but just, yeah, in terms of business, you, your question was, like you, you asked this thing about paper value versus real value. And I think on the one side, that's a, it's a big frustration often because often as entrepreneurs, you're still paying bonds very late in your journey because you're keeping the capital in the business to feed that hungry machine. Um, and that at some stage become a frustration because you understand the cost of capital, yeah. <laughs> you know, which is expensive. And, and I think everyone's so in the system, we don't realize it. You don't realize it just becomes natural to pay your interest rate on your home for 20 years. But then the upside of business, the huge upside of business, um, and the huge motivation for anyone who's not finding themselves at the top end of a corporate job and more in the middle is to rather step out and go and find yourself at the top of your own little enterprise because you truly become a master of your own destiny. Yep. And, and this idea of, I mean, if I have to think, if I had to get by on my salary, it will be absolutely impossible. And the, and the privilege of having a dividend every year is, a, is an absolute privilege. And, and to also be in charge of my greatest investment, because I always smile, I mean, the return of our business for what we bought it back for after it went bankrupt to where it's now, it had a better performance than Capitec share price. So just on gains per rand earned, and, and it's got so much stretch and it's in our control. So I think there's two sides to every story, and there's, there is the, the risk, and there's the sleepless nights, and there's the concerns, and and the fact that there's value on paper, which makes it even more fearful to lose this thing you've built for 21 years because our lives are captured in this business. But then the upside is the freedom and the, the control and being in charge of your own destiny, which is an absolute privilege. Mark, not everybody that are affluent are um, entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people earn salaries, mm -hmm. uh, the 15 percent a pension deduction goes off, uh, maybe something on the side. Uh, does that approach differ or the management of wealth uh, uh, differ to what uh, the management of uh, entrepreneurial wealth would be? Um, yes and no. Um, and the no part is that there are some fundamental basics, principles, rules, building blocks. Um, and what the industry may not want to tell you is that it's not that complex, um, but it's hard, um, and that's 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 the tricky part. Um, so there are there are there are principles that apply no matter whether it's an entrepreneurial context um, or a salaried or retired uh, person's context or someone saving from a young age. There's there's some fundamentals to to building wealth um, that apply to individuals, corporates, entrepreneurs, um, and it's a little boring, and that's why it's not exciting and doesn't get traction, but those, those are the basics, um, no, matter, no matter the context almost. If a country spends more than it earns, it's a problem and it's not sustainable. Same with an individual, same with, same with a, a startup business or an established business. Mm. Um, so there are these foundations that, 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 that apply. Um, I think when you look at the application of what's relevant and where at, at what point in time, that, that's where it's different. So at a, at a, at a startup point, um, you would really want to focus on the structuring. Um, and perhaps it's the capital mix, the funding mix, how the, how the business is structured, um, the, the, the risks to, to key men. Um, and, and that needs to start at the beginning. Um, not suddenly when, you, when it's, uh, you're disposing and suddenly, oops, uh, we haven't thought about uh, the consequences of this massive concentrated wealth creation. Um, so good planning comes into it. Um, Whereas with, with, a, with a, a, a corporate and exec, 
uh, or someone just in a, in a more you know, a corporate sense building wealth. Um, it's the same building blocks, uh, spend less than you earn, um, but then you've got to, you're looking at the context you say, it's a pension fund, it's what is your retirement plan, um, what's the risk to you as an individual to your family, um, and, and as your life evolves, um, what, what is the right advice at that point in time? And, and people do go through life-changing events, life happens, um, and, and the planning is, again, it's an anticipation that it's not, oh dear, oh dear um, I've lost my car or my house, it's, it's planning for that. Uh, so th th there are two simple principles that we actually try to apply in, in our business, um, which again spans these different contexts we think, and that is how do we help our clients make better financial decisions? It's the one lever. Just better, not perfect, just better. Um, and the second one is how do we help our clients avoid financial disasters? Whatever the context, and that is, it could be an individual, um, as an entrepreneur, as a retiree, uh, and there's different services at different points of your financial journey or those different contexts that are relevant um, at, at a point in time. Uh, but the overarching thing for us that we, we, we're trying uh, to build is just helping our clients with its personal finance related investment risk, make better decisions and fundamentally avoid being wiped out. Uh, there's a real mighty good point. <laughs> Early on. I wonder if there's a gap um, because I think it's all, it's habits. It's all kind of, it's, it, it's quite, it's, you've got to teach what you're being taught and then it goes into your life. It's like smoking, you know. It's like you don't stop smoking tomorrow because it doesn't kill you tomorrow. So you just carry on smoking. So you don't start saving tomorrow because you're not in retirement tomorrow. And you just leave it. And the stats are horrific. Mm. And I wonder if there is an opportunity to, to start reaching out to the, because it seems the client base of wealth, you get into contact with that level of expertise once you have money. Mm. But there's an opportunity maybe to reach out to the next level, which are the client's children. So, for example, um, Laurent, my one business partner, on the research for NetBank three, four years ago, five years ago even, found this methodology of using four glass pots um, to, to take your after-tax cash and to split it between 50% for spend, which include bond and, and car, and then 30% invest, 20% savings for annual savings for end of the year, maybe a holiday, and then 10% tithing. And I apply this to my then seven-year-old, and he's completely in the habit. And I'm hoping mm -hmm. that when he gets to, and he's now just started his own entrepreneurial enterprise at 11, so I'm super proud of him, but I'm hoping that when he gets into the big wide world that hopefully this habit sinks in. Mm -hmm. And when he gets his first paycheck, that 100% net salary doesn't go into my first nice flashy car mm -hmm. and a flat. Mm -hmm. And that he might apply the discipline because if I had to back, if I had to approach my life like that, yeah, I would mm. be seriously wealthy today financially. Mm. Well, I mean, just to add on to that, like um, people think you need to have a lot of money to be wealthy, and I always say you need a few money. And that's the sensate version, <laughs> and a few money is the ability to say I don't have to do this, whatever this is. So if you have a boss you dislike and you're hurt for, if you have a few money, you can say, you know what, it's been cool, thanks. Right? It's, it's just the enough money to sustain your minimum cost with hopefully an upside, right? So you should be able to pay off your house, your bond, I mean your bond and your car, and maybe maintain yourself for a, a certain period because that's essentially what you need as an entrepreneur, the ability to do that. You don't always get it right, but the point is, F you money is the ability to say and sustain yourself. So it's not a lot of money. It's not millions or multi-millions. It's just look at what you really need. And now here's the trick that I discovered is that if you reduce all the major costs in your life, so I don't have a car. I've got a dodgy A3, right? But it's reliable, right? I call it reverse snobbery because you can also market, market it to yourself. So I'm cool. I choose not to, you know? And then, you know, it makes me feel better. So when I see the red Ferrari on the side of the road, it's like, nah, it's a touche. Um, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, if, if you reduce all these nooses around your neck from car payments, whatever, you'd be surprised how little you actually need to live a life that you decide every day what you do with. And that's amazing freedom. To me, that's actual real wealth. 
It's not the quantum. It's the freedom that you can buy from, actually, essentially from yourself. And if you can do that, I think you are on a winning wicket um, because you can start doing some really cool stuff earlier on in life. Just I don't buy that completely, though. Please. I mean, because it's, it's quite a... Sorry. No, please. <laughs> Jumping in here. No, no. But, but because it's, it's psych psychologically... Absolutely, factually, the driver of most human beings, yeah. probably guaranteed in this country, is I'm not good enough. And it's, it's, it's because of where people come from. Mm -hmm. um, and the majority of the com country comes from nothing. And the thing is, when you come from nothing, you want to feel better than. And that's what's driving this materialism. If you recall, I said scratch the edge yeah, first. No, I know. So you have to, of course, <laughs> move through that. that. And yes. if you get to you, and I think that's also the benefit because because you're an entrepreneur. So you kind of you start becoming a bit more woke's the word. Oh, but <laughs> nice. Check the four fifty one year old, <laughs> Mr. Forty three. <laughs> that looks like thirty six. But it, but but it's just it's, so it's quite a thing that we're dealing with in this country. Um, is this materialistic obsession, which, which I look at with empathy because I've grown through it as well. Mm. I'm at the back end of that same tale. Mm. It's a very difficult thing um, not to do that, to want to define you as better than where you come from. And I think that's another responsibility for, for the bank is, mm. is, is, is to, to help people with that struggle, that you need to be defined by, by ma the materialistic thing that's around you and, and to help people to get beyond that. To, to something of deeper meaning and purpose in life. Okay. Um, but money, geez, man, money, money is important. You, it, it buys health. But yeah, I think risk perception is, is critical in that context because uh, not everybody has the same risk appetite. Um, and the return, risk, uh, return ratio for people are, are different. Some people are really content with a 50K salary a month or even less and make it work. Um, and you're not prepared to go out and try to do it yourself. Um, so uh, what are your perceptions about risk uh, in, in relation to, to the wealth? In fact, I wanted to touch back from, um, from, from a bank's perspective where I think there's a major disconnect. I mean, the principles are simple. Uh, it was don't spend more than you have, right? Uh, but I, I take exception to that because um, as an entrepreneur, uh, you've got a, a hypothesis on, on an idea, right? I think selling Borovos rolls at 110 rands is going to work, which is essentially what we did. Turns out if you put sesame seeds on a Borovos roll, the hipsters think you are. <laughs> okay. But a hypothesis by any definition is a guess. I don't know if it's going to work. So I'm pumping money into a level of guess. Maybe it's an educated guess, but it's still, there's no surety. And yet, it's no, it may not make money for a very long time. All right? So I am actually spending more than I'm actually getting in, sure. in the hope that at some point it's going to turn. And I really think living in a third world country like ours that should be creating new businesses that are essentially going to employ, not to employ people, to have really great products that people buy and therefore ultimately employ people. If you want to achieve growth, you got to chuck money at it. You can't have wealth preservation mode when we should be having a wealth creation mode. You can't have it both, in my humble opinion. We, we need to commit to this and chuck money at it. And even if we lose nine out of 10, it's just going down the drain. You need one billion dollar business. It takes care of the rest. Now that might be a naive way as an entrepreneur, the way I look at it, but I really think it's, it's incongruent. You, you can't try and preserve money when you're trying to create money. Is that music to your ears? No, that sounds like <laughs> a gunshot. <laughs> yeah, mindful of my executor sitting here, I'll answer that one. <laughs> um, again, I think we all agree that the importance of entrepreneurs to any economy, and specifically to our economy, I don't think that's a debate. Um, and there's a portfolio of support in our economy that, that we have to provide to ensure the success of entrepreneurs. And I think the banks are a key conduit between savers and people who need money to invest. 
and to invest into the real economy and to real businesses. Um, and I think that's a, a role where you then have to look at the, again, the, the, the context of how a bank looks at businesses and its demands uh, to run a sustainable business and manage its risk so that it's there in five and 10 and 15 years time um, to support the broader economy. So it is a balancing act around allocating capital responsibly. Um, and I think, I mean, this does talk to a maybe more esoteric, but another point around the pressures of, of companies and how they're measured and evaluated and, and the demands put on um, management to deliver quarterly, let alone semi-annual, annual mm -hmm. returns, which constrains your ability to think through the strategic um, end goal here sure. um, because your shareholders um, may not give you that runway. Mm. Uh, and in the end, uh, that's the conflict. You've got to balance um, how you're allocating your capital uh, to satisfy shareholders to be a sustainable conduit in the economy uh, with the very real demands um, of different uh, businesses. And so it, 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 it is a real trick, and I think there are constraints on both sides. Yeah. And the model, the model needs to change. I think mm -hmm. it is, there is this uh, emerging debate in society around mm. um, you know, the purpose of business um, and how we get a better balance between um, business and, and uh, the beneficiaries of the likes of banks. Especially in South Africa, yeah. It's such a, that's because because it's funny. There's two two of us, and then you, and that's why I'm so conscious. Like it can't sound like ooh, the entrepreneurs are special. The our ecology is so special. You know, the corporations. We employ 300 net bank employees, 30,000. You know, and we all have a role to play. And you also have a duty to have all those people in jobs, which is the most important thing. But I do think what you mentioned this this short termism, this 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 short term. And it's perpetuated by so many things like government terms and CEO terms and not in all businesses, but normally it's like figure four or five and it's quarter to quarter and there's no sort of quarter century planning, there's no long term view. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I was even thinking the other day, there's no sort of what's in it for the collective, for all of us together, rather than the me and the self-service. I was even thinking the other day, it's interesting that my interest rate is always better than someone of less fortune. Should it not be the other way around? Mm. And, 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 and why is it like that? And, and is that true sustainability in terms of building the economy together? Because will it make a really big difference if I make 80 million or 100 or 120 million at that stage? And can I not afford to rather pay the high interest to subsidize the lower? Mm. So I do think it's maybe time collectively to, to, to start finding real economic solutions because I do still think in a sphere of wealth, we, we're very sort of self-centered and how we preserve individual wealth. And, and, I, and I am a true believer that if you do work to your ass off to create wealth, you deserve it to a degree, but how much is enough? And at what stage do you start looking to make the circle bigger? Um, but yeah, you're right. We, start, we need new thinking almost. Um, just came up for me. Yeah, let's see. One of the big debates about capitalism mm -hmm. at the moment is uh, the fairness thereof. Um, but I want to open the floor to questions. Please, uh, uh, I think Carolyn's got a, a mic. Um, are there any questions? Hi, hi guys. Um, what makes, uh, uh, you guys all talked about it individually, about making good decisions. Well, firstly, what's the ingredients for making a good decision? And how do you take that to outside of your own personal, for example, your staff and your family? Because uh, Miles will probably know that uh, if you make a bit of money, everybody mm. comes and... and Black tax. Yes, and mm. then how do you get for your family members that are asking you to also make better decisions? Mm. So how do you get... And what's the ingredients first? Ah, favorite word, ingredients. Mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> honestly, and I've come to learn this the hard way, you need to be comfortable with failure. You need to be comfortable that, you know what, could go left, could go pear-shaped, and that's okay, right? Because if you are comfortable with failure, I mean, I always say this to my team, particularly the entrepreneurs, is that, you know, on average, a child, when he's learning to walk, they fall on average 17 times an hour. Now, imagine if the kid was like, yeah. You know what, I've mastered this crawling thing. It's kind of efficient. I can get here from this. It's quick. You know, I get there. And this falling thing, you know, maybe walking is not for me, right? 
but it doesn't happen. I, I don't know where it happens in our society where we taught that you can't fail. Maybe it's a schooling thing, you know, you have to pass all these cycle tests and stuff, and it's bad if you fail. But honestly, for me, I'm really genuinely comfortable. It's okay if I get it wrong, because then it gives you the latitude and the freedom to actually make decisions. Otherwise, you know, I find a lot of people get paralyzed. They spend so much time and e energy. In fact, they romanticize the problem. They spend more time on the problem than on the solution side, right? So they end, end up not really doing much. Um, so that's my, my answer to that. Just be comfortable that, you know, it's okay if it goes wrong. But it's slightly esoteric because usually those decisions have a lost bearing to it. But, you know. Hmm. That's a difficult question, man. So, so, so this, the, the one thing that comes up for me, I'll, I'll, I'll share two things which we're working on currently. Um, and the one, I'll link it back to the decision question, but I'm also interested how we measure life by measuring money. If you look in the business, the best measured thing with all the metrics is money. Um, and then we sometimes look at, well, we only look at the, the business growth as the 10%, the 12%, the 5 the 6% the economic growth, that's the measure. But that number never tells you, are the people happy in the business? Do they love what they do? Is the product exceptional? So we don't measure those things. And I think measure is such a beautiful way to, to create true balance. Because it's an unbalanced view. You know, my son could be making, say, a million rand a month for selling drugs. Is he a good businessman? Just because his business is making a million net a month. You know, like those we don't interrogate those questions. So I think measure to me is a very important part of my life now and to find a more balanced measuring scale than just a mere measure of money because it's so one-dimensional. And I want to bring it back to the recipe for, for like a good decision, I think is a balanced decision. So most of my um, financial mistakes has been made on emotional decisions. And, and Laurent and myself had a discussion also a while ago around what wisdom is. And wisdom is the perfect balance between magic and logic, passion and absolute pragmatism. So, so, so I, and that's where I think for me as an emotional being, the bank can play such a profound role because it will bring in that balance into my life of someone that holds me more to the cause now that I'm going into this phase of wealth creation, capitalizing cash. Um, yeah, so, so I think balance, there's not enough, we're all very emotional when it comes to money and, and, and we need that balance, that balanced view. Agreed. And I think another um, obstacle to good decision making and particularly within a, a, a finance advice uh, context, a wealth context, is complexity. And in some ways, it's almost as if the industry uh, breeds complexity mm. uh, and it introduces a paradox of choice. So it gives you more and more options. Mm -hmm. It's just a growth. You're just, you're just absolutely bombarded with choice. And at the same time, we're bombarded with information, the access to information. So we're more informed. You know, we were debating earlier, well, why don't we just educate people? Well, I don't argue that there's never been a better time to be educated um, than, than living in today's era. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, no, there's no barrier to information. Um, and the, the, the sheer abundance of choice that you have um, is, is, is bigger than ever before and growing. Uh, and the paradox of choice is that given and costs have dropped as well. So it's just a perfect environment um, to do more when it comes to your money. And yet people make worse decisions um, when they're given more choice because there's so much complexity and that then brings in the emotional, what do I do? And there's lots of bright lights and, um, mm. and things competing for our attention. Um, and so in terms of financial decision making, it's trying to reduce the complexity uh, to make better decisions. But choices, I think, is critical. Uh, I came out of varsity. I'm a, I'm a trained accountant. Mm. My girlfriend was a journalist. I thought, geez, that's a cool job. Uh, so I became a journalist. Um, and it had a profound impact on my financial position. Um, <laughs> but uh, every morning I work a lot of hours. I get up and I'm really, I want to get to work and I want to do a great job. And when I leave late, then I'm happy. I think uh, I did a great job today. And I don't know how that measures into, into wealth. Um, but that being content and it's more than just money, um, I think that is, uh, it's also a, 
a paradigm. Mm. Uh, so, I don't know whether these are, these are questions and more observations, um, and they also stem from my own journey. And I, I think there's this anxiety of a long time that you actually have to make money, and there's anxiety just in that. When you start to make money and you get money, you, there's a hell of a lot of loneliness and a lot of anxiety of where am I going to actually put that money? Because, you know, where South Africa is going? Must I put my money ashore? And who you turn to for that advice is very interesting because often we want to actually turn to sources of people that we trust. Not always in our mind the bank, because the bank is seen sometimes as wanting to sell their own products. Mm -hmm. so for me, there's an interesting thing around how do you actually disrupt a little bit that paradigm a little bit is that the bank is actually uh, an objective source of, um, of, um, you know, of, of advice um, on the one hand. And the second, the, the, the second thing is around the fact that uh, there's these stages of life, and I would argue, for example, in the case of Pepe, that 13 years ago also correlates to the, t the time when he had a child. And the fact that actually a child change also quite a bit of perception on what wealth is, because mm -hmm. it, it became not just about you, but about your own children. That it per personally had a massive uh, impact on the hearts of wealth um, in my life. But what, what I thought is that these life events trigger new awareness around wealth, wealth, Ill, wealth is. But it would be great to lean on someone. So, so what is actually happening in my mind, my experience, is we're incredibly myopic about in our, in our lives because we wait for these life events to happen to us. But we don't think about, oh, but one day you'll have kids, and one day you'll have to leave kids to someone, or you'll have, and so on and so forth. And I think the role for me of, of a bank could be to get you out of that uh, myopic way of seeing things and see the bigger picture. Uh, and, 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 and I think I would I'd love for actually a bank to actually make me aware of, but no, you can't see the issue in that way you got to see it in X many ways type of thing because we are lonely and we're quite myopic in the way we, we, we deal with these things. So just a few observations. Do yeah. you want to respond to that? It's, there's one interesting part of the, of, of, of the value chain within financial services and the banks, one, one part of that, um, which perhaps highlights this, this difficulty as well around uh, what the consumer, what, what clients need, what people need uh, versus how the industry operates. Um, and it's something, again, very dull, um, very unsexy, um, very uncomfortable, um, and not profitable. Um, and that is a will. Your last will and testament. Um, and that is a fundamentally vital and arguably the most valuable tool in the whole financial planning process. And yet the market price for it is almost zero. And so we have this disconnect between how, how the industry works, how it makes money, and, and versus the real client need. Um, which it, it's, a, it's another example, perhaps, of the example you were uh, saying, Pepe. I would pay someone for advice at that point in time. Um, but unless that world is connected to a whole bunch of other products and services in the conventional uh, value chain, um, that service in and of itself um, doesn't really have the right, mm -hmm. the right price. And so there's, there's, there's some real challenges. Um, I also think, sorry if I may interject, is that I also think that there's a cultural aspect to that, right? I think certain communities are comfortable with discussing money and death, uh, not so much in other communities, right? And, and I think, you know, one of the key things that gets lost about diversity is diversity, if it's used well, it's like a profit generating mechanism because you get to understand a market segment you couldn't have possibly understood because it's not your lived experience, right? So if you now know that this community, this is the issues around money, and probably why I've had such a bad relationship with money is because in my community, I think largely no one knows how to deal with it themselves, never mind imparting knowledge. Um, but it's a huge market, right? So if, I don't know, if you could infiltrate it and bring it down to that, person's lived experience and bring it down to something they can understand, I think you can fundamentally change generations in terms of relationship with money. Because it's not rocket science to some degree. You know, you do this and you do that. But if I don't have a lived experience of I've never bought a property, you can tell me 10 times that I should buy property, but like, hello? You know what I mean? So we need to find a way to link that, in my, in my opinion. Yeah, but I think a lot of people would look to you as an entrepreneur, a successful entrepreneur, for financial guidance. Um, and to your point, 
maybe not always have the bank at the top of the list. I would argue I'm not a successful entrepreneur yet. Uh, I mean, it's all relative, right? It's like uh, we're discussing with Pepe. It's, it's when you're busy doing, I'm trying to figure it out myself, right? I am. So am I the best person to part on advice? I can't tell you what to do, right? But I think I can pretty much tell you what not to do. Do you, do you see the difference? Uh, so my, my impartment of knowledge is based on experience of the things that I saw that I tried that didn't quite work out. So I can kind of warn your nose. But your wisdom is the certainty of if you do X and Y, this, it's more forward looking. I, I do agree with him. I, I really do. I, I do think, and I'm saying this more from a point of view of of that opportunity because I think there is a real need for it because when you're in the process of, of keeping a business in business because that's actually the number one priority is to keep a business in business and keep people in jobs. When you're in that mode, the last thing on your mind is making the money work for you and, and, and I do think that is the expertise of NetBank which is why I'm taking my money to NetBank because I want NetBank to make sure that that money works for me, not for me to make sure. I'll make sure the money keeps on coming in there. And I do think there's an opportunity to be more proactive in that way um, because that could become a fantastic differentiator because in, in, in my experience, it's, 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 it's more reactive, not pointing to NetBank, just banking in general, but there's a real role. And I think NetBank, I can say for one, I trust the bank more than anyone else because I see the bank as risk averse. Mm -hmm. And when you start getting into money, you don't want to risk it because it was so hard to get it. So, 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 so hence, I'm going to fall back onto the bank. But I do think there, there's opportunity. It's not a duty or anything like that. There's, a, there's an opportunity for the bank to be more proactive in that way and to see it as a real expertise. I'm an expert in making communication. I'm not an expert in, 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 in making money work yeah. harder. Um, my efforts make the money that, that I'm looking towards the bank's expertise to work as hard as possible at the least risk as possible. Um, yeah. Oh, that's a critical trust relationship. Mm. Um, absolutely. Are your wills in order? Mine. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Maybe. Mine is I'm with NetBank. Got <laughs> 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 multiple uh, in South Africa. <laughs> Any more questions, Connie? Um, thank you. Um, you know, I've got a bit of a cynical view. Um, and basically, you know, I think entrepreneurship is a bit uh, overrated, you know, um, and particularly in a society like South Africa because uh, there's not sufficient, like, sort of uh, support system, you know, um, because more people fall through the cracks than those who survive. <laughs> You know, and I guess until you're able to put systems to support people, you know, um, you gotta create more failures than you know successes. Uh, it's great to have successes. I mean, you you can point them out, but I can tell you, you know, <laughs> the failures are actually much more greater. Um, um, but th that doesn't detract from the liberating spirit of being successful as an entrepreneur. But I just think, you know, we sort of somehow sell that idea, you know, out of context. So I'd, I'd like to just comment on that. I agree with you. I mean, SARS released a stat that 80,000 entrepreneurs went out of business in the last decade. I mean, that's reality. One in 10 will make it past three years, and one in 10 of those 10s will make it past 10. So it's one in 100. One in 1,000 will make it to 50 years. So it's, it's super rare. Um, but I mean, I always push this, that spirit because I think if the, if the fundamental driver of starting your own business is potentially to get you out of poverty, then we're sitting on like a very positive opportunity in South Africa given the amount of poverty because that is the one way to get you out of it. As long as you're not going to do it to think you're going to make money quick because it's, it takes 17 years to make money if you're an entrepreneur. Yep. Um, but, but I agree with you. It's not easy. 
and, and everyone can't be because then we won't have people to work with in our businesses either. <laughs> so, but, but if you look at Rwanda, it's got a 33% entrepreneur ratio. I think it is one in three. And, and they are thriving. And, and this country needs to thrive, exactly. So I think we, we're coming out of a, a, a decade of, of not real focus on the things that are most important, which is education that could lead to a more entrepreneurial spirit. But um, yeah, it is. Thank you. I was, I'm very interested in the topic as you had it. What story will your money tell? Mm. We've been talking a lot about wealth. It's not quite the same thing. Now, wealth, like it's been explained, it's, it's a social surplus that you've created legitimately out of your earnings, out of your effort. Now, if you look at South Africa context, especially in the last 10 years or so, there are a lot of people with a lot of money. I don't know that you can call it wealth, in as much as you don't call the guy who's just did a heist on the highway and has now got a lot of man, money, you don't call them wealthy. Mm. But there are a lot of people, when you look at how they arrived at the money that they have, you then have to ask, what story will your money tell? Has it been earned legitimately? Where are the business ethics? Now, in South Africa, that's almost like a rhetorical mm -hmm. question these days, and they're very, on the face of it, respectable people who've been able to create respect for themselves purely out of the amount of money that they have and not out of their character or the things that they do. So what story will your money tell? What are we telling our kids? Is it about that you have money? or how you are making it? Hmm. Is it sufficient that you've got all that money? Or is it more important about how you made it? I think I have a slightly contrarian view to that, uh, in a sense that 25 years in into our democracy, um, I think if you look at America, in its genesis, there's a reason why it was called the wild, wild west. People were shooting each other off the streets, robbing banks, right? Uh, until you have a sheriff, and then, you know, you look at how Manhattan in New York was built. It was built of bootlegging. It was the mafia moving uh, and running speakeasies. That then turned into, when you've got all that surplus of money, then you need smart people to, to grow that money. Banking services were built off, um, you know, from, shall we say, nefarious deeds, right? Of course, there's no, you can't glamorize bad deeds. There's no two ways about that. But I do think context matters because a hundred years from now, I've often seen that the people who've made money, you know the story that says the victor tells the, writes the history. I mean, the, the people we celebrate, the Rockefellers and all these people, uh, dig deep. No, but I'm saying is, uh, I don't know. I agree but, with you. Uh, uh, but the end does not justify the means. It. I, I, I would fundamentally 100% agree with you, but I think what I'm going through at the moment is a, a high realization to look at just myself, because that's all I can control, because such a personal thing. So I would like to, I would like my story of my money to be linked to ethical behavior, to, um, to putting in the sweat to offer value through what I do. And I wouldn't just, I'd link it to every single, because I've now realized I had a beautiful insight on eight forms of wealth rather than just money. And it, it really opened my head. And in our business, we're trying to look at the business like that as well. To even say the business exists, there's a spiritual reason for the business existence. Like Ned Bank says, it's got a greater purpose. 
Each business should have a greater purpose, and that should dictate its ethical behavior. Um, but I completely, I, I think it can't just be the end. It's it, that that way that you get to that end. If 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 for me personally, and if 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 not you definitely, I know not you. And I get the point you're making, but I think we are quite aware of the amount of people that are making billions of rands by not ethical behavior in this country. And I think that's just a, a way of a conscious shift that this nation is going through, and it points towards ourselves to make sure we pull our own socks up. Because it's easy to do this, but we need to keep on looking at ourselves. So I think, again, it just makes us, it makes us aware as leaders of, and captains of industry of the importance of leading by example in this country that needs leadership. But fundamentally, I agree with you. The route to making, creating wealth should be, it should be profound. And it would be pretty empty to end with that money without a profound journey towards that money. So that's actually the true wealth. The wealth is actually the journey towards the money. <laughs> I think um, many like, rich people are put on pedestals um, and people look up to those people. And if your, those people see you just as a rich man, uh, it is different to seeing you as somebody who's actually uh, providing leadership, providing, showing um, how uh, you can use that money for other purposes. Not just seeing a rich man, but seeing somebody that's making a difference. Um, and I think once you've reached that st stage, your, the way your, you, you've used your money um, and the, the way it is allocated um, also in shows what your attitude towards wealth is. I think, Greg, if I can, if I just say, so I think that's part of what we're trying to achieve here through what stories will your money tell, is to get those connections um, between how people where made their money or where it came from and what they did with it. Uh, and uh, maybe implicit is, 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 is are good outcomes uh, and around how when you connect money to a greater purpose in an individual's life or their business, um, how that is good for everyone. And we've got some fantastic examples, and we're hoping to, to, to build a conversation around um, people telling their stories of how um, money has ultimately led to, to stories and experiences, uh, to value, to recognition, to respect uh, that, that I think everyone wants. Um, and res you get respect not by how much money you have, and that's what we're talking about mm -hmm. here, but by, um, by contributing and being valuable um, and, and, and uh, fulfilling a role in society. We have, um, we have fantastic uh, contrast between uh, individuals who really live that purpose and set up foundations that are now worth hundreds of millions um, that, that contribute to society, and that's their legacy. Uh, and they made money, but they put it to good, and it's, 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 it is going to continue uh, in perpetuity. And that's a great example of stories that that person, their legacy, um, uh, can, uh, it lives uh, through, the, through the, the really constructed application of wealth. Uh, that's one example of stories, but I think it is it's what we're trying to get the narrative yeah. going here, to challenge mm -hmm. these notions that uh, success um, and you will command respect just because you have money. Yeah, and to contradict this, 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 I love that. And, and I love the, the opportunity to contradict this, this evil side that we've given money because inherently it's, it's, it's there to do good. It really is, and I think those stories if you unpack them, because the, inherently that's what we collectively should be doing, collectively as a nation, is to do good. I think we have time for one more question. No, I, I was just building on uh, what was said. No, I think the paradox is that the way you're making your money impacts the amount of money you will make eventually. And I think I'm, I find it's a little bit the Facebook paradox at the moment. Because I'm, I'm at a point now, I actually might just quit Facebook because of the story of Facebook with Mark Zuckerberg. I don't like his story and the way he made his company. And so it eventually is going to hit Facebook and starting to hit uh, sort of Facebook. The way you're making money, I think, has got actually uh, an impact on the, the, you know, the money that you want to make. So. Any more questions? Well, I think uh, this was an absolutely fascinating discussion, and uh, uh, you know the, the panelists will be around. Uh, so please, during breakfast, engage with them and, and, and see uh, 
if you can get more knowledge and wisdom from them. I've just got one last question for you, Pepe. You said your 11-year-old son is de uh, developing his own business. Uh, what is that business and can we invest? <laughs> 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 so, so, so this, um, this is, it absolutely blew me away. I also started working at the age of 11, so I find it's interesting and we don't push him at all. We give him total freedom. But we've got a market tomorrow afternoon at work and he decided he's going to participate and he started making jewelry. Um, my wife's a goldsmith, um, so, and he called it Jazzy Jewels. And, and he was, he's so practical because he's got his mother working for, for, for him and he's got his nanny working for him. And he's taking hours down and he wants to make 20 rand an hour and pay them for their hours. So he's worked this whole thing out, which it fascinates me. He's really good at maths, but he can't write or read. And he's 11 because he's at Waldorf. But I call it Waldorf, but, <laughs> but, um, but, but I love that school. I love it because, you know, yeah, anyway, there's long, many stories. Two plus two is 22 and all these beautiful things. But, um, but I asked him a fundamental question yesterday. And just out of interest, I was taking him to school. And I said to him, because he understands, because we speak about money being a byproduct and money being, we understand it's the lifeblood of business, but we won't wake up to make blood. And I explained to him all these things because there's greater purpose to business. You know, there's greater purpose to business, purpose to business not to make money. So he, he, he is the sort of rhetoric in the home. So I said to him, so what's the purpose of your business in one word? So he said, joy. So I said, well, what does that mean? He said, I want to inspire people through joyful jewelry. And I thought, how, like, how profound. I was so proud of him because he gets the purpose of business <laughs> at the age of 11 and it will be my wish that more people in our country understand that purpose comes before profit. Mm -hmm. And when you find purpose in business, the profit actually exponentially starts expanding because you're behaving with a bigger purpose than just margins and, and metrices. So. Pepe, uh, Miles, Mike, thank you so much. Uh, I think this was a good discussion. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.